Did you know that two out of every three guys will experience some form of male pattern board despite the time they're 35? Yeah, I did. For me, it was more like 25. I wish Keeps had been around when I was younger because advancements in science meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss so you can keep the hair that you have. Look, it's too late for me. My hair is not coming back. But you don't have to be like me. You can stop your hair loss early thanks to Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved drugs for treating hair loss, so you might have tried them before, but never at a price this low. That's right, if you were thinking, Ugh, some sort of medicine, Simon, it's gonna be expensive. Well, don't worry. Keeps starts at just ten dollars a month how does it work well for one thing there's no need to visit a doctor's office just schedule a quick online consult and a little bit later discreet package gonna arrive at your door so if you're noticing that you're losing your hair it's not a problem it's gonna fix itself guys do something about it for a limited time go to keeps.com forward slash biographics or you just click the link in the description below to save 50 percent off your first order and now today's video Legend has it that on the 20th of June 1941, a team of Soviet archaeologists opened the tomb of a mighty Central Asian ruler whose ruthlessness and skill in battle was second only to Genghis Khan. His tomb bore the inscription, When I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble. When the archaeologists located the coffin, they read an even more ominous threat. Whoever opens my tomb shall unleash an invader more terrible than I. Two days later, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa against the USSR, the largest land invasion in history. The legend goes that when the fearsome warlord was again sealed in his tomb, the Soviets won at Stalingrad. This archaeological expedition actually took place, but I wouldn't bet on the accuracy of any other details. But this story captures the fearsome reputation of today's protagonist, Amir Tamur the Lame, also known as Tamerlane. Abandoned mercenary of Mongol origin, he rose through the ranks, becoming the most powerful ruler in the 14th century Islamic world. Eventually, he conquered an empire stretching from Delhi to the Mediterranean. In the words of historian Beatrice Forbes Manns, Timur could boast a stature bigger than life and a charisma bordering on the supernatural. Before we get into the birth and rise of today's protagonist, let me give you a little bit of context. After the death of Genghis Khan, the Mongol Empire was split between four of his descendants. His second son, Chagatai, inherited a vast territory in Central Asia, which became known as the Chagahired Khanate. This polity included most of modern-day Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, parts of Mongolia, and China's Xinjiang province. The Khanate's economy was based on nomadic herding and was less outwardly aggressive than its northern neighbor, the Golden Horse. This wasn't out of the kindness of their hearts, but because of constant internal strife and division. Eventually, the Chaghadayad Khanate fragmented into several entities, the largest being the powerful Mogulistan in the east and the less formidable Transoxiana in the west. In this divided land, a boy was born in 1336 AD. His birthplace was Kesh, modern-day Sharabzabs in Uzbekistan. His father was called Tarakai, a minor nobleman of the nomadic Balas tribe. These were a Sunni Muslim Turkicized Mongol group, once allied to Chagatai. At birth, he was called Timur, meaning iron, a name which carried an omen of strength, tenacity, and conquest. Timur and family never had a place to call home. Following nomadic habits, they roamed the steppe south of the capital, Samarkand, looking for the best pastures for their livestock. The young Timur soon grew tired of looking after grazing animals. His parents were not clan leaders, but the Barla society allowed upward mobility for tough youngsters who were handy with a composite bow, especially if shot from horseback. Timur displayed a clear talent for violence and action, a talent which he put to fruition by stealing horses and sheep from neighboring clans. Soon, he added banditry to cattle rustling on his CV and built a following of like-minded young warriors. At the age of 21, in 1357, Timur trained his gang into a mercenary outfit and entered the service of two Tughlaq Timur, the Khan of nearby Kashgar. Shortly afterwards, the ruler of Transoxiana, Amir Kazgan, died. Tughlaq took the opportunity to invade, and in 1361 he conquered Samarkand. The young Timur must have played an important role in the conquest, as he was appointed chief advisor to Tughlaq's son, Ilyas Koha. From shepherd to bandit to minister, aged only 25. Not bad, but also not enough 
Timur was not happy to play second fiddler to Elias Koya, so he forged an alliance with the ruler of Balkha, modern-day Afghanistan, the emir, or prince, Hussein. The friendship was consolidated when Timur married Hussein's sister. The two bros kicked off a rebellion against Tughlaq and Ilyas, which did not go as planned. The two fled to the region of Khorasan, southwestern Afghanistan, where Timur resumed his mercenary activities. In 1363, during a skirmish with enemy horsemen, an arrow pierced his right hand and knocked him off his horse. As a result, he lost his little and ring fingers and suffered a permanent injury to his right leg. From then on, he developed a lifelong limp. He also acquired the nickname that would make him immortal, Timur Elenk, or Timur the Lame, better known in the West as Tamerlane. At this stage, one may define Timur as an exiled upstart with a prominent physical disability. This may have been a clear disadvantage, especially in territories spawned from the Mongol Empire, which valued physical prowess and nobility of blood. Only descendants from Genghis and their relatives could aspire to the title of Khan. But Timur's ambitions knew no boundaries. In 1364, he spotted an opportunity to continue his climb. Tughlaq had died, and it was time to settle scores with his son, Ilyas. Timur and Amir Hussain attacked Transoxiana, conquering the entire region by 1366. As it happened before, Timur was the power in the shadows, while Hussein had assumed titular power as Khan, establishing a new capital in Balkha. But the relationship between the two brothers-in-law started to sour. The Khan had grown arrogant, imposing a despotic rule and amassing the wealth of his subjects. According to some sources, he may have even kidnapped one of Timur's sisters to join his harem. As a big no-no, of course, if you fancy your best friend's sister, it's probably better to marry her. But more realistically, the last straw was when Hussein refused to pay his soldiers' wages. In the spring of 1370, Timur started to plot, building alliances with other military leaders. Soon, he commanded a formidable army and went on the attack. Hussein's forces were beaten time and again until Timur besieged Balakh. Hussein's loyalists fought desperately, trying two sorties which inflicted heavy casualties on their enemies. But Timur pressed on, and a defeated Hussein sought refuge in the mosque of Balakh, offering all of his riches in exchange for his life. According to contemporary sources, Timur shed some tears at the sight of his old friend begging for mercy, but his allies bade for revenge and killed the Khan in cold blood. It seems then that Timur's tears dried up very quickly as he collected an imposing war booty and married four of Hussein's widows. One of them was Saray Malk Khanum, a descendant of Genghis Khan. With this newfound legitimacy, Timur restored the capital in Samarkand and declared himself sovereign of the Chagadai Khanate, restorer of the Mongol Empire. Still, he styled himself as Amir rather than Khan, honoring the Central Asian traditions. But titles meant little to the pragmatic leader. He knew that true power rested on the saddles and bows of his unstoppable army, and he was ready to build an empire. For the following ten years, Timur fought endless campaigns, conquering areas corresponding to today's southern Kazakhstan, western Uzbekistan, and the Xinjiang province in China. He even joined the Golden Horde in their fight against the Russians, occupying Moscow. And then he took on the Lithuanians at Poltava, Ukraine. Many of these campaigns may have been dictated by the opportunity to pillage some sizable loot, but Timur was a capable long-term strategist. His end goal was to consolidate power along the Silk Road, the wealthiest commercial route linking Europe to the Far East. By controlling it, he would ensure a consistent income to fund his expeditions. He appeared to achieve victory without much effort, but of course the military prowess of his armies did not happen by chance. Timur's forces were a composite bunch, with soldiers joining from every corner of Central and East Asia. But the core, the elite, came from the steppes of Transoxiana. These men made up an army, some 140,000 strong, disciplined, and staunchly loyal. Timur's almost supernatural charisma ensured that they would follow him everywhere. They fought mainly on horseback, and their weapon of choice was the composite bow, which they mastered from an early age. By their early teens, each nomadic horseman was able to shoot an arrow every five seconds, hitting targets at 60 meters distant. These highly mobile units were complemented by well-trained infantry, specialized in siege warfare. When meeting an enemy in a pitched battle, Timur eschewed the traditional formation, which included a center, wings, and a reserve. Instead, he split his army into seven divisions, three at the front, three in support, 
support and a reserve to the rear. This allowed him to throw in fresh horses and riders when needed, wearing out the enemy defensive lines. Furthermore, Amir realized the limitations of his army. He knew they were good at conquering, and less so at holding territories. Therefore, he concentrated occupation forces in rich agricultural lands and was happy to let go of the less profitable steppes. One such land full of riches was Persia, which the conqueror targeted in 1383. The ruling Ilkhanid dynasty was extinct, and too many competitors vied to fill the power vacuum. Taking advantage of this civil strife, Timur invaded from the north, capturing Herat. Its inhabitants suffered horrific treatment, which was to serve as an example for other cities. Timur's army plundered all treasurers, leveled ancient landmarks, and slaughtered many of the defenders. Rumors of such ruthlessness spread across the country, and several cities like Tehran surrendered without a fight. Others, like Isfahan, fought back only. To regret it later. Timur ordered a massacre of Ishafan citizens, and their skulls were piled up in morbid towers several meters high. By 1385, all of eastern Persia had fallen. The land was depleted of its riches as well as of its most talented inhabitants. The emir deported artists, architects, intellectuals, and artisans to Samarkands, where they would contribute to the building of an imperial capital. In Timur's vision, the city was to be the beating heart of the Islamic world as well as the cultural hub of Central Asia. Samarkand was to become a tangible testament to Timur's ambition to be recognized both as the defender of Islam and the restorer of Genghis Khan's greatness. And the track record of the lame prince was indeed worthy of his role model. Between 1386 and 1394, he was unstoppable. Southern Iran, Iraq, Mesopotamia, and the Caucasus all bent the knee. Timur's campaign to control Azerbaijan was conducted alongside Takatamish, Khan of the Golden Horde. The two allies, though, soon dissented over who should control the Silk Road. As we know by now, Timur was not above turning against old friends, and a new war was on. Initially, Tokatamish had the upper hand, invading Transoxiana and even besieging Samarkand. However, he was repulsed, and Timur chased him back into the Russian steppes. In 1391, the Golden Horde was defeated on the Kondurcha River, but they returned with vengeance four years later. The two armies clashed again in April of 1395 over the Terek River, northern Caucasus. This time, many of Tokatamish's generals defected to the other side, and Timur's victory was decisive. During this campaign, the unstoppable conqueror raised the ground the cities of Sarai, Azov, and Astrakhan. As his attention was diverted, Persia revolted against the emir, but the revenge was swift and utterly brutal. More towers of skulls obscured the sun. In September of 1398, Timur set his sights on India. In his view, the Sultan of Delhi, Mahmud Toglakh, was too tolerant of his Hindu subjects. He amassed an army of 90,000 men and crossed the Indus River, attacking Delhi on December the 17th. Mahmud put up a strong defense by deploying dozens of war elephants covered in chain mail and topped by wooden towers. But Timur had a plan. He had the battlefield covered with spiked iron cow troops, which wounded and diverted the attacking beasts. Then he unleashed a charge of riderless camels, each carrying a load of blazing hay. The terrified elephants stampeded their own troops, sowing confusion and panic. The wondrous city of Delhi soon became another wasteland of ruins. The following year, Timur looked to the west to settle accounts with the Ottoman Empire and the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt, guilty of having seized Mongol lands in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. The confrontation began with some serious trash talk. Timur wrote to the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid, Thy obedience to the Quran in waging war against the infidels is the sole consideration that prevents us from destroying thy country. Bayezid replied, what are the arrows of the flying Tartar against the scimitars and battle axes of my firm and invincible Janissaries? Well, I guess we'll see, won't we? The Timurid steamroller galloped westward, storming Aleppo, Damascus, and Baghdad in 1401. 20,000 of its citizens were slaughtered. After setting camp for the winter, Timur reached Anatolia in the early summer of 1402. He first laid siege to the town of Sivas, promising not to shed a drop of blood if the inhabitants surrendered. And they did. 3,000 of them then were buried alive. So, technically, Timur kept his promise. The next challenge was Bayezid's main army of 85,000 men. The two forces squared off at Ankara on the 28th of July. 
Timur had managed to turn many Ottoman vassals to his side, outnumbering his foe almost two to one. But Bayezid knew how to fight a defensive battle. He deployed his infantry along a stream on hilly terrain. Thus protected, the infantry could raise a shield wall, shielding the cavalry units from Timur's attacks. Seeing the futility of the initial charges, Timur decided to wear out the opponents with a stratagem. He had a creek diverted, denying Ottoman horses and their riders from access to water. The demoralized horsemen were ultimately scattered by a charge of war elephants, which Timur had imported from Delhi. The elite janissaries, now without mounted support, were easy pickings for Timur's heavy cavalry attacking their flanks. But Bayezid inspired his surrounded men to fight on until nightfall. He then attempted to break out of the encirclement, but was captured by his enemy. The Sultan was brought back to Samarkand, where he suffered a humiliating captivity at the hands of Timur, who allegedly used him as a footstool. The Ottomans had thus lost not only their leader, but 40,000 of their finest soldiers. The power vacuum in the Ottoman Empire resulted in a civil war to the delight of Western European powers. Always weary of the Ottoman threat, the kings of England, France, and Castile sent messages to Timur congratulating him on his victory. The Castilians even sent an ambassador to Samarkand, Roy Gonzalez de Clavio. Clavio gave a vivid account of Timur's court and exotic grandiosity. He was especially impressed by the emir's 15 palaces, many of which could be disassembled and moved when necessary. He also described how the supposed defender of the Islamic faith was a heavy drinker who organized lavish feasts every night. When one guest showed up late to one of his parties, Timur punished him by piercing his nose like a pig. After Clavio departed in November 1404, the aging Timur prepared for what would be his last expedition, this time on the receiving end would be Ming China. The Mir had had a bone to pick with the Ming since 1395, when their emperor had sent a message describing himself as lord of the realms of the face of the earth and treating Timur as a subordinate. He retaliated by detaining the emperor's envoys. When more messengers came looking for them, he also had them put in jail. Timur's plan was to get rid of the arrogant emperor and replace him with the Yuan dynasty, descendants of Kublai Khan. The usual careful planner this time committed a huge mistake. Good sense would dictate initiating military campaigns in the spring to take advantage of the good weather and plentiful pastures for the war horses. But Timur set off in December 1404 at the head of 200,000 troops. His astrologers had seen good omens in the stars, but uh, the weather begged to disagree. The frosty climate made the trek increasingly difficult for the army. Whilst crossing the Sir Daya River, Uzbekistan, the once undefeated leader fell ill, possibly as a consequence of the cold. The scourge of Central Asia probably had wished for a glorious death in battle. But in February of 1405, aged 69, Timur died of natural causes. During his decades of military successes, the prince had failed to create a functioning government structure. Power was almost always centered around him. With no trusted lieutenant to take his place and inspire the troops, the expedition melted away. The 200,000 soldiers marched back to Samarkand. Timur's body, embalmed in oils and laid in an ivory coffin, was buried in a splendid mausoleum, the Gur er Amir. Six centuries later, the legacy of Timur Ileng is controversial to say the least. Driven by ambition and skill, a disabled cattle rustler and mercenary had defeated some of the most powerful nations in Asia and the Middle East, assembling a large empire. His actions in Anatolia weakened the Ottomans long enough for the Byzantine Empire to survive 50 more years, and his defeat of the Golden Horde allowed for the expansion of Russia, Lithuania, and Poland. But while in power, he focused mainly on destruction and conquest. Some estimates place his death toll at 17 million, about 5% of the global population at the time. His inattention to political matters eventually left his empire at the mercy of foreign invaders. As his line of succession was not clear, his last surviving son and his grandsons fought each other for dominance, losing the western half of the empire. Nonetheless, his Timurid dynasty survived for yet another century, while Samarkand flourished as a center for the arts, literature, and science. A later descendant, Babur, took control of Kabul and later Delhi, founding the Mughal dynasty. And I'll leave the last word to you. Was Timur a great ruler whose actions and influence had a huge impact on the geopolitics of Eurasia? Or maybe you agree with military historian David Nicole, who argued Timur might have been a great soldier, but in purely historical terms, he could be seen as the greatest bandit of all times. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.